from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Justicia Berta, justice for Berta. A shocking new report looks at who ordered the killing of Honduran activist Berta Cáceres and finds evidence of a broad plot that reaches up to the highest levels of DESA, the company whose hydroelectric dam project Cáceres and her indigenous Lenca community were protesting. We'll get an update from New York Times reporter Elizabeth Malkin in Mexico City. Then Republicans cancel a hearing with San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz, who is set to testify alongside FEMA chief Brock Long today. We received a statement by uh, uh, Congressman Benny Thompson uh, stating that the majority, Republican majority, for the second time in a row, has canceled the hearing with no uh, date for it to be rescheduled. Um, I'm just wondering, what are they afraid of? Then, a federal judge blocks part of President Trump's transgender military ban. We'll speak with a former trans Marine who is the challenging the ban. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In New York City, eight people were killed and 11 more injured when a driver intentionally drove a pickup truck down a bike path along Manhattan's Hudson River Tuesday. Officials are calling it an act of terror. Police say the attacker was 29-year-old Sefulo Saipov. He reportedly drove a rented Home Depot truck down the bicycle lane, killing at least eight people before crashing into to a school bus. He then reportedly jumped out of the car, waving a pellet gun and paintball gun. Police say he yelled, God is great, in Arabic, before being shot by police in the stomach. He survived the shooting. Authorities say they uncovered handwritten notes in Arabic near the truck that suggests Sepov had declared allegiance to ISIS. Authorities say Sefulo Sepov came to the United States from Uzbekistan in 2010 and has lived in Florida, Ohio, and most recently in Patterson, New Jersey. This is New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. It's a very painful day in our city. Horrible tragedy on the west side. Let me be clear that, based on the information we have at this moment, this was an act of terror, and a particularly cowardly act of terror, aimed at innocent civilians, aimed at people going about their lives who had no idea of what was about to hit them. We, at this moment, based on the information we have, we know of eight innocent people who have lost their lives. In response to the attack, President Trump tweeted, quote, in NYC, looks like another attack by a very sick and deranged person. Law enforcement is following this closely, not in the USA, unquote. Trump went on to tweet, I have just ordered Homeland Security to step up our already extreme vetting program. Being politically correct is fine, but not for this, unquote. Among the victims of the attack were five Argentines who'd gathered in New York to celebrate the 30th anniversary of their high school graduation. In Afghanistan, ISIS has claimed responsibility for a suicide bombing in the capital, Kabul, which killed up to eight people and wounded many more. Reuters reports at least eight people appear to have died from the blast and that all the victims were Afghan civilians. The attack occurred in the heavily fortified Green Zone. Afghan authorities say the attacker appeared to be as young as 12 or 13 years old. In more news in Afghanistan, The New York Times is reporting the U.S. military has begun redacting important information about the U.S respect Afghan security forces. The figures redacted from the most recent Inspector General's quarterly report include the size of the Afghan army and police force and how many soldiers and police have been wounded or killed. This information used to be made public. Since 2001, the U.S. has funneled tens of billions of dollars to Afghan security forces. In Yemen, a U.S.-backed Saudi-led airstrike has killed at least 26 people at a hotel and adjacent market in the northern Sada province. The ongoing U.S.-backed Saudi-led bombing campaign has killed more than 10,000 civilians, sparked the cholera epidemic by destroying Yemen's health, water and sanitation systems, and exacerbated a famine that's left 7 million people on the brink of starvation. 
On Capitol Hill, executives from Facebook, Google and Twitter testified to a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee Tuesday about how Russia spread propaganda ahead of the 2016 presidential election using the major social media websites. On Monday, Facebook disclosed as many as 126 million users were exposed to the political advertisements bought by a Russian-linked company. This is Facebook's general counsel, Colin Stretch, being questioned by Delaware Senator Christopher Coons about one of these ads. The ad claims that Hillary Clinton is, quote, only one politician except Barack Obama who is despised by the overwhelming majority of American veterans. And it says if Clinton were elected president, the, quote, army should be withdrawn from her control according to amendments to the Constitution. This ad is nothing short of the Russian government directly interfering in our elections, lying to American citizens, duping folks who believe they are joining and supporting a group that is about veterans and based in Texas, when in fact it's paid for in rubles by Russians. Should Facebook be allowed to be a platform that foreign adversaries can use to run political ads, sir? Senator. That advertisement has no place on Facebook. That was Facebook's general counsel, Colin Stretch, being questioned by Delaware Senator Christopher Coons during the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee hearing Tuesday. And this is Facebook's Colin Stretch being questioned by Senator Al Franken. How did Facebook, which prides itself on being able to process billions of data points and instantly transform them into personal connections for its user, somehow not make the connection that electoral ads paid for in rubles were coming from Russia. Those are two data points. American political ads and Russian money, rubles. How could you not connect those two dots. Special counsel Robert Mueller is continuing to widen his investigation into whether President Trump's campaign colluded with Russia to influence the 2016 election, with plans to interview Trump's current communications director, Hope Hicks, and multiple other current White House officials. Hicks has already retained a personal lawyer. The expansion of the investigation comes after Mueller announced the first indictments in the investigation, charging Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort, and his former business associate, Rick Gates, with 12 counts, including money laundering and conspiracy against the United States. Both men surrendered themselves to the FBI Monday, and they're now under house arrest. New revelations show Manafort had three different U.S. passports, each with different numbers. Rick Gates has 55 different bank accounts with 13 different banks, including some based in Cyprus and Britain. President Trump is also trying to discredit and diminish the significance of a third Trump advisor, George Papadopoulos, who pleaded guilty in early October to lying to the FBI and is cooperating with investigators in exchange for a more lenient sentence. On Tuesday, Trump tweeted, "'Few people knew the young, low-level volunteer named George, who's already proven to be a liar,' unquote. White House Chief of Staff John Kelly is facing widespread criticism for his comments about the Civil War during a Fox News interview Monday. Robert E. Lee was an honorable man. The lack of an ability to compromise uh, led to the Civil War. And uh, men and women of good faith on both sides made their stand where their conscience uh, had them make their stand. Historians have denounced Kelly's comments as dangerous. In response, award-winning author ta Coates tweeted an extended history lesson about the Civil War and criticism of John Kelly, which includes Coates writing, quote, "...when the adult in the room believes a war for slavery was honorable, believes that the torturer of humans, vendor of people who led that war, was honorable, you really do see the effect of white supremacy," ta Coates quoted. Amnesty International is slamming the Israeli government for refusing to allow Ra'ad Jarar, their advocacy director for Middle East and North Africa, to enter the Israeli-occupied West Bank. He was stopped at a crossing between Jordan and the West Bank while on a personal trip to visit family after the death of his father. Amnesty said, quote, the fact that Ra'ad Jarar was barred from entry after being interrogated about his work with Amnesty International appears to suggest this move was taken in retaliation for the organization's work on human rights violations in the occupied Palestinian territories, unquote. 
In Iraq, Kurdish journalist Arkan Sharif has been assassinated. Eight men broke into his home in a village outside Kirkuk and stabbed him to death in the early hours of Monday morning. His killing comes only hours after armed men attacked a television crew in Erbil. Iraq is one of the world's deadliest countries for journalists. Meanwhile, Danish inventor Peter Madsen has admitted he dismembered the body of Swedish journalist Kim Wall and dumped her cut-up body parts into the sea. Wall was last seen alive August 10th, when she boarded Madsen's submarine. Denmark's largest daily newspaper has called her death the most spectacular murder case in Danish history. In Peru, women competing in the Miss Peru beauty pageant protested violence against women by refusing to disclose their waist, hip and breast measurements, and instead presented statistics on the murder, rape and harassment of women. My name is Karen Cueto, and I represent Lima, and my figures are 82 femicides and 156 attempted femicides so far this year. My name is Samantha Batallanos. I represent Lima, and my figures are a girl dies every 10 minutes as a result of sexual exploitation. My name is Juana Acevedo, and my figures are more than 70 percent of women in our country are victims of street harassment. My name is Kelin Rivera, and I represent Arequipa. My measurements are 6,573 cases of violence against women have been registered in my region. You don't. We'll have Back in the United States, accounts of sexual harassment continue to rock the U.S. journalism industry. Top political journalist Mark Halperin has been fired from NBC after a number of women accused him of sexual harassment when he was at ABC. Meanwhile, the head of NPR's top news department, Michael Oreskes, has been placed on leave as NPR investigates accusations that Oreskes kissed two women without their consent while he was Washington bureau chief of The New York Times. Both women say they were meeting with Oreskes to discuss working at The New York Times when he kissed them and stuck his tongue in their mouths. In Utah, nurse Alex Wubbles has won a $500,000 settlement after being violently arrested by police at the hospital for refusing a police officer's demand she draw a blood sample from an unconscious car crash patient. Police body cam video shows the police attacked Wubbles, arrested her, forced her out of the hospital as she screamed, and into an unmarked car on July 26. After the footage surfaced, the hospital said police would no longer be permitted in patient care areas, such as the burn unit where Wubbles was working that day, and the police officer has since been fired. And New Jersey's attorney general has sued Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, accusing the drug company of deceptive marketing that has fueled New Jersey's opioid crisis. New Jersey is one of 11 states that have now sued the pharmaceutical giant over the opioids. To see our interview about the Sacklers, the secretive family that owns Purdue and has made billions off the opioid crisis, you can go to democracynow.org. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show with shocking new revelations about the assassination of renowned Honduran indigenous environmental leader Berta Cáceres. On Tuesday, in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, a team of international lawyers released a new report that shows how the plot to murder Cáceres was months in the making and went up to the highest levels of the company whose hydroelectric dam project Cáceres and her indigenous Lenca community were protesting. The report's release celebrated the effort to push back against the brazen impunity with which the murder was carried out. Justicia Berta, justice for Berta, they chanted upon the report's release. In 1993, Berta Cáceres co-founded the National Council of Popular and Indigenous Organizations of Honduras, or COPING. For years, the group faced death threats and repression as they stood up to mining and dam projects they said were destructive to their ancestral land. 
Then on March 2, 2016, Cáceres was gunned down just before midnight in her hometown of La Esperanza. At the time of her death, she was organizing indigenous communities to resist the Aguazarca Dam on the Gualcarque River, saying it threatened to contaminate her community's water supply. Now, a team of five international lawyers have found evidence that the plot to kill Cáceres went up to the top of the Honduran energy company behind the dam, Desarrollos Energéticos, known as DESA. The lawyers were selected by Cáceres' daughter, Bertita Zuniga, and are independent of the Honduran government's ongoing official investigation. They examined some 40,000 pages of text messages and say the conversations are proof that the orders to threaten Copi and disrupt its protests came from DESA executives. The investigation also revealed DESA exercised control over security forces in the area, issuing directives and paying for police units' room, board and equipment. In their new report, the lawyers write, quote, the existing proof is conclusive regarding the participation of numerous state agents, high-ranking executives and employees of DESA in the planning, execution and cover-up of the assassination. For more, we go to Mexico City, where we're joined by Elizabeth Malkin. She's a reporter for The New York Times, has read the new report and details its findings in her article, Who Ordered Killing of Honduran Activists? Evidence of Broad Plot is Found. Elizabeth Malkin, welcome to Democracy Now! Talk about who did this report and what this broad plot is. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much for having me. Um, the report was compiled by five international lawyers um, from the United States, from Colombia, from Guatemala, um, who reviewed evidence that was given to the family of Berta Cáceres by the um, uh, Honduran public ministry. Uh, and. Uh, really combed through these te text messages. The text messages uh, were found um, on phones confiscated, seized by the Honduran uh, government as part of their investigation. Um, and uh, uh, it basically, there are three phones, one seized from the DESA headquarters and two from suspects. Um, these suspects are a um, an environmental manager for DESA and a former uh, envi uh, security um, uh, security uh, chief for DESA, who had worked for the company until 2015. And what these messages show is that the company um, executives, and those are not named in the report because they have not been indicted, uh, were in close contact with these two suspects. Um, uh, in, during uh, the, the months leading up to the murder uh, in March of 2016 and in the days afterwards. Um, so what this is uh, suggesting is that this was not the action of rogue employees and ex-employees. This was a much more concerted uh, action. Uh, and um, what the family hopes is that the, the, um, the report will push Honduran authorities to investigate further. And Elizabeth Malkin, for those who are, have not followed the Berta Cáceres case, who is currently in custody uh, in relation to her murder, and what's the status of their uh, of their uh, of their arrests? Of their arrests, uh, they were arrested. Um, four people were arrested a couple of months after her murder, and then additional people were arrested. Uh, a, a few uh, weeks later, um, the uh, there are eight people in custody. Uh, the two that really stand out are uh, Sergio Orellano, who was um, the uh, company's um, environment and community manager, in effect, the person in charge of relations with the community, um, and uh, Douglas uh, Bustillo, who had been the um, uh, uh, the security manager for the company until uh, the summer of 2015. Another uh, military officer um, is also in custody. Um, and then the, the rest appear to be people uh, are sus the rest the, the remaining suspects appear to have been uh, people hired uh, to carry out the killing uh, based on the evidence um, in the report, which uh, details their movements. 
um, as they, uh, the days uh, before the murder, now, how the assassination. Now, how many texts are you talking about that were in the phones of, uh, of in the phones that were taken by the authorities but never dealt with for a year and a half? Is it something like 40,000? It were, um, these were 40,000 pages of um, messages. Uh, they're WhatsApp conversations. Uh, WhatsApp is very widely used in Latin America. And um, what the uh, lawyers were able to do is they used a metadata company that was able to analyze these. It's an awful lot of material to go through. Um, and uh, the question is that um, the Honduran authorities have had this data themselves. Uh, whether they've been able or willing to analyze it is the question. Um, and what they've, uh, you know, why they haven't moved more aggressively to investigate other people in the company uh, who are on those messages. Uh, remember, those people are not named, so we don't know exactly who they are. Uh, but but they, uh, it is the job of the hunter and prosecutors to, to investigate. They're amazing. I mean, you quote from this new report about the plot to kill Berta Caceres in your story. In The Times, you write, quote, an attempt to kill Ms. Caceres was planned for early February, but called off, the lawyer said. Mission aborted today, Mr. Bastia wrote to a DESA executive. Yesterday, we couldn't. Mr. Bastia returned to La Esperanza for several days at the end of February and arranged to meet with with the same executive on March 2nd. Early on March 3rd, after Ms. Casades was killed, Mr. Bustillo called him again. After the killing, Mr. Rodriguez, the environment manager, forwarded details of the crime scene report that police had provided to one of the company's executives. Yes. Sergio Relax, another executive, wrote through WhatsApp a few days later, everything will come out OK, you'll see, don't panic, and pass that on to other people. I mean, these uh, quotes and texts and emails are incredibly damning. They are indeed. And, and, and so the question is why Honduran authorities haven't moved uh, more uh, aggressively to um, investigate. Uh, the way the case looks now, and it's going throw, very slowly through the courts, which is, is normal for Honduras, um, but the way the case looks now, you have one rogue employee, a one ex uh, 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 rogue employee uh, just kind of acting on their own. And these texts show us that that's very difficult to accept and that more needs to be done. And I, I did speak with Berta's daughter, and she said that's what our hope is, that, you know, this will push authorities to move and investigate the company uh, more thoroughly and uh, determine who ordered this. It's very common in Latin America for the material authors of a crime to uh, be um, uh, uh, prosecuted, to be tried, but the intellectual authors are uh, somehow uh, uh, succeed in remaining at large. And the decision of the of the writers of the report to not name the executives that, that were participating in these text messages. Why why was that? Um, well, um, these are human rights investigators. They're not prosecutors. Uh, and um, so that they determined that it was not appropriate to release those names. So can you talk about the significance of Berta Caceres? Talk about her work and why the company may have wanted her dead. Um, this is what's very strange, and I was talking with uh, one of the investigators, one, one of the uh, lawyers, about this. This was not a large dam. This was a dam being built on the Gualcarque River. Uh, more dams were planned. Um, but uh, from the beginning, um, the company was very determined to push forward uh, with this dam. Now, under international law in indigenous communities, there is a, a requirement to consult with the community before any project like that. And that is widely um, uh, ignored or simulated uh, across Latin America. Um, and uh, so this, I think, became a test case. Uh, and Berta was a, a very strong leader. The, the organization that she led and that her daughter now leads is called COPIN. 
um, and there was a great deal of violence against Copine before the murder. Uh, the protest by Copine had succeeded in um, driving away the construction company, a Chinese construction company. Um, and the, it had also forced Dessa, the uh, dam developer, to move the dam to the other side of the river. Um, uh, the company uh, did have foreign funding from European development banks, from a Central American development bank. And so it became a kind of battle of wills. Um, in 2015, Berta Cáceres won the Goldman Prize, which is really the kind of Nobel Prize for grassroots environmental activists. And, and the hope was that it would protect her, um, and it didn't, obviously. Uh, so this, this case is really a sign of how far uh, companies are willing to go to push through um, projects like this. Uh, for Honduras, it's a sign, um, it's, 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 a, it's a test case of impunity. Honduras is a country where uh, a very small number of people control large parts of the economy, and they have strong links to the government. Um, they're often in the government. And uh, the question is, uh, and, and these economic actors uh, basically have been able to do what they want to do. Um, and the, the, the Berta's, uh, the Copin's resistance really was a sign that, no, you can't do exactly what you want to do. We will try to stop you. Um, and so this investigation is really a, case, a test case for whether this impunity should, should um, if there's a way to counteract this impunity. Um, in 2015, Hondurans marched in the streets across the country, not in Tegucigalpa only, to protest corruption and, and impunity. It was a massive outpouring. And um, they uh, demanded an international uh, panel, uh, similar to what Guatemala now has, uh, um, to inv investigate corruption and impunity. Um, well, uh, and, Elizabeth, uh, uh, Elizabeth Malcolm, I just wanted to ask you, in, in relationship to those mass protests, Honduras is scheduled to have elections uh, uh, later this month. I'm wondering your sense of whether uh, the Berta Cáceres case is going to have, uh, and what's the lack of resolution by the government in it, is going to have any impact uh, on those elections? Um, I'm, I don't think it will have a strong impact. Um, the, uh, the current president, Juan Orlando Hernández, is uh, leading. Um, he faces uh, a number of uh, candidates who oppose him, but the leading group is an alliance um, of, of different parties. Um, and uh, I think that, really, the issues of corruption and poverty are those that predominate, and security, corruption, poverty, and and security. And so Berta Cáceres' case is part of that, but I don't think it's going to be the key uh, factor. I wanted to go to Berta Cáceres herself, back in 2013, speaking to Democracy Now! No, claro que no. Eh, la población hoy... The population today, those who've been in resistance were from the Libre Party, are challenging the repressive apparatus, with the absence of the construction of real power from the communities. But now, these people are voting enthusiastically for the Libre Party, that we hope will be distinct from the other political parties. This scenario is playing out in all the regions of Honduras, in Zacata Grande, Garifuna communities, campesino sectors, women, feminists, artists, journalists, and indigenous communities. We all know how these people have been hard hit, especially the journalists, LGBTQ community, and indigenous communities. This is all part of what they've done to create a climate of fear. Here, there's a policy of the state to instill terror and political persecution. This is to punish the Honduran people so that people don't opt for the other way and look for changes to the political economic situation and the militarization. That was Berta Cáceres speaking uh, in 2013 to Democracy Now! One person who helped with this report is Miguel Ángel Urbina Martínez, a criminal justice expert from Guatemala and advisor on judicial reform. Um, we only have 30 seconds 
seconds. But, Elizabeth Malkin, can you talk about the lessons to draw um, from Honduras now, as we see um, the same uh, kind of uh, fight for fighting impunity, the very powerful elite tied to the government and the murky military ties? Um, compared with Guatemala, uh, Guatemala has been really a model for the region, and Hondurans who protested uh, um, want that model. Uh, they have. Uh, there is another. Uh, there is a, a, a model. A, a group with a little less power, but they are beginning to make their voices uh, heard. This is the Masi. They have begun to investigate D Dessa. Um, and the uh, way it was able to win an, a lot of contracts. So this is perhaps the first crack for Honduras in um, in this impunity. And, um, and do you see uh, any you know, Aguazarca with... executives being arrested now that this information is out? I really couldn't say. Uh, certainly, there will be pressure for an investigation. Um, uh, but it's it's hard to tell whether the government is willing to move forward on this. Elizabeth Malkin, we thank you for being with us. A New York Times reporter will link to your piece, Who Ordered the Killing of Honduran Activist Berta Cáceres? Evidence of Broad Plot is Found. Elizabeth um, Malkin works for The New York Times. She writes from Mexico City. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back on why the San Juan mayor, Carmen Yulín Cruz, went to Washington to testify before Congress, and then the hearing was canceled. Stay with us. Corre el río Gualcarque, Tomás en su corriente y Paul en la alegría que nos baña. Una se pregunta de dónde tanta fuerza, de dónde. by Claudia Acevedo. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Puerto Rico, where the island's recovery after Hurricane Maria dominated a Senate hearing Tuesday and was supposed to be the focus of another hearing in the House today, before it was canceled. San Juan Mayor Carmen Julín Cruz was set to testify at the hearing alongside FEMA chief Brock Long. But Republican lawmakers canceled the meeting, saying Cruz had been added to the event without enough notice. Cruz took to Twitter to respond Tuesday night. Hi, this is Jolene Cruz. I just landed in D.C. I was invited by Benny Thompson, uh, from home, ranking member, uh, Democratic from Homeland Security Committee, uh, to a hearing where the director of FEMA, John Lomberg, and myself were going to appear and testify as to the effectiveness of FEMA. Uh, in my case, uh, that wasn't going to be uh, the case, because, of course, you know, that even though I have said that in the past week, week and a half, things have sped up, um, it was deplorable the way that FEMA acted against the Puerto Rican people. So here we are, we just landed, um, and uh, we were told, we received a statement by uh, uh, Congressman Benny Thompson uh, stating that the majority, Republican majority, for the second time in a row, has canceled the hearing with no uh, date for it to be rescheduled. Um, I'm just wondering, what are they afraid of? Uh, the truth has been told. People have seen all over the world how the United States uh, Trump's administration, uh, because I always have to make that difference. There's a difference between the American people and the Trump administration and how they have treated Puerto Rico. And now, if anyone had any doubt in Washington, D.C., 
with this canceling of the meeting, uh, perhaps they thought I was going to back out. Well, I never back out from telling the truth, and we're going to keep on fighting. So we're going to use the time to visit people in Capitol Hill, those that aren't scared of the truth, those that can handle the truth, so that they will help us make things better in Puerto Rico. That's we're going to keep up the fight. That's San Juan Mayor Carmen Julian Cruz speaking from Washington, D.C., on Twitter Tuesday night. The hearing at which she was set to testify uh, had, has, uh, t had been has not been rescheduled. Well, earlier on Tuesday, FEMA head Brock Long testified before the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, where he insisted FEMA had nothing to do with approving the controversial $300 million no-bid contract with Whitefish Energy, a tiny company based in the hometown of Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke in Montana. The Whitefish contract was not a FEMA contract. Um, PREPA entered into this contract in late September. We were notified several weeks after the fact. Um, our lawyers, there's not a lawyer inside FEMA that would have ever agreed to the language that was in that contract to begin with, so let me be very clear about that. Uh, and uh, we raised the red flag and basically saying, you know, we're not sure this is a sole source contract or a competitive rate. There were many things wrong. There was also language in there that would uh, suggest that the federal government would never audit Whitefish, which there's not a lawyer inside FEMA that would ever uh, agree to that type of language. So the bottom line is, is that, um, as I understand, not one dollar has gone towards um, that contract from FEMA. And what we're doing is rectifying to make sure that um, PREPA has not requested any funding for that, that reimbursement effort. So that's FEMA head Brock Long testifying on Tuesday. The Associated Press reports a priceless attached to the Whitefish contracting uh, sets rates for more than $20,000 an hour for the heavy lift Chinook helicopters, um, among other things. But the governor of Puerto Rico announced on Sunday, actually while we were in the offices of UTIR, the Electrical Workers Union um, chief, uh, that they will try to cancel the contract with Whitefish, $300 million. But it is not exactly clear what it means, he said, after paying them for immediate work, Juan. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, st they're still going to have to obviously uh, pay some uh, some penalties here in terms of the fact that Whitefish has brought all of these folks uh, to Puerto Rico and will have to be uh, they'll have to be compensated and finish some work. Uh, but this is just part of the continuing problem of the uh, not only the corruption uh, in unfortunately in Puerto Rico, but also of the failure of the entire uh, oversight system that the United States has set up. I, I want to uh, let folks know the. the the Financial Control Board had a meeting <laughs> uh, this week, and among the things that they decided was— The Financial Control Board over Overseeing Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico, right. They had a meeting this week, and they uh, and among the things that they decided is they now have reestablished a $10 million limit on any contract that the government of Puerto Rico can issue without their approval, uh, and they reserve the right to review any contract, uh, but that uh, they you know, any contract above $10 million must first be reviewed and approved by the Financial Control Board. They've also appointed now an emergency manager uh, over the uh, Puerto Rico Electric Company, uh, a former Air Force colonel, uh, uh, who is now basically the emergency manager of the company. And, uh, Interestingly, there's another contract that hasn't received much attention, which is that the Army Corps of Engineers has given uh, initially it was a $240 million contract to the giant floor corporation to also get involved in fixing the electrical grid in Puerto Rico. But then the Army Corps of Engineers announced that that's gone to $840 million, uh, up to $600 million increase. Uh, and, and uh, Viewers should be—watch uh, uh, this floor contract, because floor is well known as a, as a major infrastructure company that specializes in privatizing water supplies, uh, in being able to take over the management of public water utilities. And is floor the COBRA contract that they're talking about? No, that's separate. That's, uh, <laughs> which is another $200 which is million dollar another contract, $200 million which, dollars. when we spoke to the San Juan mayor in San Juan um, on Friday, she was looking at the $300 million contract 
contract than the $200 million contract. I mean, they're calling for the resignation of and uh, the firing of the head of um, of PREPA, which is the public power union, who signed these contracts. And this whole question of uh, Brock Long, the head of FEMA, saying, well, we had nothing to do with this. Uh, well, uh, clearly, there is a, a morass that is developing in terms of recovery uh, in Puerto Rico. And the federal government is implicated, the Financial Control Board is infl uh, implicated, the governor, the, the local government of Puerto Rico is implicated. Uh, and we're going to continue to see huge problems, I believe, uh, in the recovery effort in Puerto Rico, because everyone's pointing fingers, but at the same time, lots of people are making money <laughs> off of this recovery. So, as the governor announced they were going to try to cancel this um, Whitefish Energy contract on Sunday, we were in the offices of Angel Figueroa Jaramillo. He is the head of UTIR, the Electrical Workers Union in Puerto Rico. We were asking him about Elon Musk's proposal to make Puerto Rico a model of sustainable energy. I asked him how to rebuild the devastated grid, if it's possible, in a more sustainable way, and whether solar power has to mean privatization. Primero, la complejidad del sistema eléctrico de Puerto Rico, un sistema totalmente First, the complexity of the electrical system of Puerto Rico. It's a totally isolated system. A system with a large amount of demand poses a major challenge in terms of looking at the possibility of solar power for powering the whole country. It's very complex. It requires many studies, a lot of analysis, many evaluations. And the people of Puerto Rico can't wait for all that right now. Now, that doesn't mean that Puerto Rico doesn't have to look very seriously at the possibility of the transformation towards solar power. Nonetheless, the transformation that UTIER believes is most appropriate is are for solar communities. The communities themselves should appropriate that system. It's not that we will become a commodity for renewable solar energy. Are you interested in meeting with Tesla, Elon Musk, or his representatives to figure out what a solar solution or a sustainable solution would be for Puerto Rico? Claro, claro que sí, claro que sí. Yes, yes, of course, of course, yes. We have to meet and search for alternatives to transform the country. This doesn't mean that we're against, I mean, in favor of this becoming privatized. I believe that we have to meet and have a dialogue. We have to search for alternatives. But we are very clear, all the alternatives have to be owned by the community. That's Angel Figueroa Jaramillo, the head of UTIER, the the Electrical Workers Union in Puerto Rico. Well, when we were in Puerto Rico, just before we got to his office on Saturday night, we stayed in an apartment like most of the country had no electricity. When we got there in the middle of the night, it was dark. But just next door, there was a bed and breakfast that did have electricity, because it was powered entirely by solar. This is Tisha Pastor, who runs the Casa Sol Bed and Breakfast in Old San Juan. You have a bed and breakfast here in sí, Calle Sol? We have a bed and breakfast in Calle Sol. Uh, we, um, it's a sustainable uh, uh, building, so we have solar panels and we have a well that we have uh, from 2,000 to 3,000 gallons of water, clean water, because we have filters that clean that water. And some of them came from the, uh, from, uh, from the roof, a little bit of, uh, from the roof, the water. Uh, so you got been, a lot of water during the hurricane? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been working since uh, two weeks and a half uh, or three, uh, receiving like uh, firemen from New York, uh, people uh, who wanted to come and, and help. Uh, the first week was for neighbors that couldn't uh, live without uh, any water or electricity, so they, they need a, re a, a respiratory thing to uh, uh, to sleep, mm -hmm. and uh, we help the neighborhood with uh, with our 
um, uh, fridge to reserve uh, water and and stuff and 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 like uh, cooling their water. And you have solar panels. We have solar panels. Can you show us? See, we oh. have 30 solar panels. And we have the solar panels here, and. Uh, because of that, we can receive people and we can help the community uh, as much as we can. We um, uh, do kind of a, uh, everybody came here, uh, can take the ice, uh, take the, the water and put the, uh, the, the ice on the, on the fridge and in the afternoon can take it back home. So we help the community as much as we can. And so now there isn't clean water in this neighborhood except for what you have, well, and there's no electricity except well, for what you there, have. There is, we don't have electricity, but now we have clean water. Uh, since uh, two days ago, they fixed our pumps from, uh, from, uh, for the neighborhood, and now we have the water. Uh, at least we have water uh, since two days ago. But you have electricity because of the solar panels, See, not because of the non, city. Not because of the city, yeah. Right. Yeah. And the water, would you drink it? Uh, here, yeah, <laughs> because we have filters, and with the filters, we uh, we can drink the water, yeah. That's Tisha Pastor, who runs Casa Sol Bed and Breakfast in Old San Juan. So right next to her, we stayed, and uh, there was no electricity, as in most of the island, Juan. But this issue of, can a sustainable grid be built, and does it necessarily have to mean privatization? Well, I don't think it does uh, uh, require privatization, but I do think that the issue of solar power and uh, and wind power uh, in Puerto Rico is really the key to the future of the island's uh, energy independence, because right now Puerto Rico uh, requires uh, oil to power 50 percent of its electrical capacity, uh, while in the United States, I think it's less than 1 percent or 2 percent of, of U.S. Uh, generating capacity comes from oil. Another 15 to 20 percent of Puerto Rico's generating capacity comes from natural gas, uh, and uh, another big percentage from coal. So imported renewables— Imported coal. You know, imported. Well, everything is imported. The oil, the gas, and the coal, they're all imported. Uh, so that the reality is that as long as uh, Puerto Rico depends on imported fossil fuels to power its electrical grid, not only is it polluting, uh, continuing to pollute the planet, but it's also be, uh, being dependent uh, on the suppliers. So the uh, energy independence for Puerto Rico is really a national issue uh, that requires an immediate solution, and the best solution is clearly uh, solar and wind power. Well, um, that does it for today's report on Puerto Rico. We'll be bringing you reports across the week. Just having returned from Puerto Rico. And let's not forget that on Monday, uh, U.N. experts condemned the U.S.'s handling of the disaster in Puerto Rico, saying the response was ineffective, that the mainland states of Florida and Texas had received far more support after being struck by hurricanes than Puerto Rico. And we'll see what happens with San Juan's mayor, who flew up to Washington, D.C., for a hearing today, which, when she landed in D.C., was canceled. When we come back, a federal judge blocks part of President Trump's transgender military ban. We'll speak with a trans former Marine who's challenging the ban. Stay with us. In Motion, Cold Beat by Chaos, by invitation. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.
We turn now to a federal judge's decision to temporarily block President Trump's proposed ban on transgender troops from serving in the U.S. military. On Monday, federal judge uh, Colleen Colarcatelli uh, blocked Trump's directive, writing that the proposed ban, quote, does not appear to be supported by any facts. In her opinion, the judge wrote, quote, there is absolutely no support for the claim that the ongoing service of transgender people would have any negative effect on the military at all. In fact, there is considerable evidence that it is the discharge and banning of such individuals that would have such effects, unquote. The judge also blasted President Trump for announcing the ban via Twitter. The ruling came after six active-duty transgender service members sued the Trump administration. This is 18-year-old Dylan Cohere, one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit challenging the ban. Then one day in July, just before I was supposed to start my program at UNH, I got a text from my best friend saying that President Trump had just tweeted that transgender people would no longer be allowed to serve. And I honestly did not believe it. I was angry and I was frustrated, and I felt directly targeted. And because of it and the military policy changes that followed, I cannot participate in ROTC. Not because I am not capable or qualified, but entirely because of who I am. And unless these legal efforts to halt President Trump's ban are successful, I won't be able to join the military, fulfill my dream, and serve my country. That was Dylan Cohere, one of the six active-duty transgender service members who sued the Trump administration over the proposed ban. Well, we're joined now from Chicopee, Massachusetts, by the lead attorney in this lawsuit, Jennifer Levy, director of GLAD's Transgender Rights Project, and in Nashville, Tennessee, by Z. Shane Zaldivar, a transgender former Marine community activist hotline uh, program director for Trans Lifeline. Jennifer, let's begin with you. The significance of the judge's ruling, and if you could specifically address her emphasis on President Trump's tweets. Yeah, uh, so the court ordered that the military may not ban transgender people from serving, that there's no military reasons for doing so. And can you explain what it is she was ruling on in your lawsuit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, President Tweet last summer, uh, sorry, President Trump last summer issued a tweet that said transgender people would not be allowed to serve, and he followed that with a White House memorandum that set a specific date for discharging transgender people who are currently serving. So we challenged that on behalf of six people who are currently serving in the military who have been serving for decades, proudly and courageously. And what this judge said is that not only are there no military reasons for denying transgender people the ability to serve, but that the military itself, after exhaustively studying this issue, said that transgender people, allowing transgender people to serve strengthens the military. Well, the, the judge writes in her ruling, uh, many, quote, many transgender service members identified themselves to their commanding officers in reliance on that Obama administration pronouncement. Then the president, Trump, abruptly announced via Twitter, without any of the formality or deliberative processes that generally accompany the development and announcement of major policy changes that will gravely affect the lives of many Americans, that all transgender individuals would be precluded from participating in the military in any capacity. These circumstances provide additional support for plaintiffs' claim that the decision to exclude transgender individuals was not driven by genuine concerns regarding military e efficacy. The judge—that's what the judge wrote. Uh, Jennifer Levy, uh, this was a stunning decision. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what the judge recognized is that President Trump precipitously, without care or thought, reversed military policy. Transgender people have been allowed to serve openly, have been doing so courageously, defending this nation. And the tweets showed that the, the, the harsh language that it included, the categorical and sweeping ban on the community reflected the fact that this was intended to target a politically unpopular group of people, and it had absolutely no basis in military judgment. 
Well, let's turn to President Trump's tweets. Back in July, he tweeted, After consultation with my generals and military experts, please be advised the United States government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. Our military must be focused on decisive and overwhelming victory and cannot be burdened with the tremendous medical costs and disruption that transgender in the military would entail. Thank you. He wrote. Those were three separate tweets put together. So I wanted to ask Z. Shane Zaldivar, you're a trans former Marine. What was your response when those tweets came down in July? Where were you? Were you shocked? And what do you think now that they're trying to say, we never instituted any change? And yet you have the judge saying, what are you talking about? A tweet, as you of yourselves have said, is a presidential announcement. Um, for me, uh, it was shocking. Um, there was a lot of hard work that um, LGBT and trans individuals have done um, since the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and before um, to to help um, for our um, GLBT service members to open to serve openly um, and to to get this news from a tweet uh, seemed disrespectful to uh, folks who give their lives every day to protect this country and the rights that we have. And uh, your reaction uh, to, uh, to the judge's decision? Um, I mean, this directive uh, violates the fundamental guarantees of due process afforded by the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. Um, you know, this doesn't change policy. Um, what it does is place the policy under review. Um, trans service members are still uh, protected under the current policy until this review is submitted. Um, but even once it's submitted, um, this shows that, there, that the president has bias against a marginalized community of citizens. Um, so even if the, um, the review would come back and say, uh, again, what the RAND report um, and the Palm Center report says, which is that trans service members in open service does not harm military readiness, um, it is that taking um, trans service members out of their units um, is what actually does, indeed, um, harm military readiness and effectiveness. Um, Z, you are the hotline program director for Trans Lifeline. What is that? Uh, the Trans Lifeline is a suicide prevention and crisis management hotline for the transgender community. And after President Trump made this pronouncement in this series of tweets that apparently most in the Pentagon did not even know were going to go down in July, did not even know what he was referring to when he first announced we're announcing a major change in policy. That was the first tweet. Some thought he was going to announce that we were bombing North Korea. Um, what was the response in the hotline? What kind of tension have you observed? Has it increased among the trans community? It certainly has. Um, this shows that there is bias and prejudice against a marginalized community. Um, folks that weren't necessarily service members, um, nor um, wanted to become service members, never thought uh, that they would be, um, felt directly attacked. Um, because, again, this is targeting the transgender community, and this is um, federal-sanctioned um, discrimination against one of the most marginalized groups of people in this country. Now, you, uh, Z, you served in the, uh, in the Marines from 2001 to 2003, during the period of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Could you talk about your own experiences uh, uh, with that policy and then the impact of how the, when the Obama administration uh, did away with Don't Ask, Don't Tell? Sure. Um, I got into community activism and social justice work because I was honorably, honorably discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, and so I fought, uh, first and foremost, for myself to get back into uh, uniform and to get back to my unit, um, who, at that time, we were in a period of conflict and combat. Um, and realizing, after fighting for the repeal, that even under the Military Readiness Enhancement Act, this still didn't include transgender persons. So I knew then that I was going to continue to have to fight to, to um, include trans folks in open service. Um, and we had thought that we won that fight um, in 2015, uh, and now we're continuing to have to fight for uh, the fundamental constitutional right to serve our country.
Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. I want to say former Alabama chief um, Roy Moore um, just tweeted uh, or just said uh, in a statement issued on Monday night calling for the removal of the judge who struck down Trump's ban on transgender people in the military, saying her decision was completely ridiculous and a clear example of judicial activism. Um, he is now running for the U.S. Senate um, out of Alabama. And that does it for our show. We want to thank uh, Z. Shane Zaldivar for joining us and Jennifer Levy, attorney with GLAD's Transgender Rights Project. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. There are internship applications available at Democracy Now! Go to democracynow.org. Thanks for joining us.